understanding the vehicle of how you buy is really important, right? Because a lot of the times, one of the things when I work with clients and they're doing an EA renewal, we go through their contract and actually explain to them how it works. And there's a lot of misperceptions by clients on how an EA works, how a CSP works. And by the way, there's a lot of misperceptions within Microsoft on how these things work. Um, I tell people all the time that inside of Microsoft, there's a very limited group of people that actually know how licensing works. Most people, even if your account managers, especially, but even if they have a, like a licensing specialist title, they're actually not licensing people, they're licensing salespeople. And that's a huge difference. They're taught, they're taught how to sell these EA programs and things like that and get you to buy subscriptions and annuity licensing and things like that. They don't actually understand how licensing works. And so we'll hear all the time from clients, well, Microsoft told me this and you're telling me you know, something different. And so we'll actually go in and you know, find it in the product terms and show them how these things work and then go back to them and document it and say, okay, Microsoft, tell us why this doesn't work. And then um, Microsoft goes, oh. So, um, so that's one of the things that you want to be um, cognizant of is just always validate this stuff because even Microsoft doesn't, doesn't know how um, a lot of these things work. So what we're gonna talk about now is how the different bundles get put together because this is the, the, the crux of how you end up saving money or how you end up overpaying Microsoft and get stuck on the, you know, the term vendor lock-in I know gets thrown around quite a bit, but this is how they get you, right? Um, they get you on these bundles and they build them in ways that, you know, sometimes you end up buying stuff that you don't want to because you need it. So, you know, for instance, I have a client that wants Teams Data Loss Prevention or Teams DLP. It's all they need. That product is stuffed into a suite with six other products and there's no way to break it out. And they're just banging their heads because this thing's gonna cost millions of dollars. And it's not, it's not a product that has any business value of that level to them. Although I guess I, I you know, Microsoft argue with them that if they get sued because something leaks out of Teams, then it costs them more than the licenses. But anyways, so first off, I can't take credit for the diagrams that we're going to see. There's a guy out there by the name of Aaron Dinich, 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 I think is his last name. M365maps.com. Um, he's a Microsoft employee that actually puts these together and it's the best. They aren't official from Microsoft, by the way, although he's a Microsoft um, employee, they're not, a, they're not official um, diagrams from Microsoft, so to speak. But if you went into the public domain for Microsoft, you won't find anything nearly as good as this. So I always recommend to everybody, um, go out, grab these things off of m365maps.com follow Aaron on uh, Twitter um, if you want to stay up to date because he does a, he does a really good job of putting these together. And as we go through this, uh, yeah, it's Aaron Dinich. Um, and so there's his Twitter account, it's just Aaron Dinich um, and his LinkedIn. But you know, I suggest following him because he does do a really good job at these things. And so this is an eye chart, okay? But this is the crux of how it all starts to work, okay? So I talked about Office 365 E3. And an Office 365 E3 is all the stuff here. I don't know if that we would consider that red or orange, but I'm gonna go with red. All the stuff over here on the left in this reddish color, okay? Then we talked about how the EMS suite uh, was also a product that Microsoft has. That's in the bluish stuff here. And then you have your Windows 10 or your Windows desktop OS, and that's in green here. And the boxes inside of the bigger boxes are the products. Remember I said Office 365 is not a product, it's a marketing label or marketing brand. The products are all the little boxes inside the big O365 box, okay? And then if we put all three of these into one part number, that's M365E3, okay? So remember when I talked about an EA, I could buy just Office 365E3, I can buy EMS E3, or I can buy Windows 10 E3, I can buy one, two, or all three, right? And what Microsoft wants you to do as a customer is to move to the Uber bundle and buy all three, okay? But 
some customers still aren't there, right? And so you see this stuff here that is in, I don't know, a different shade of blue. I don't know what, I don't know what color I would call that, but the different shade of blue. That's actually that core Cal bridge that I talked about earlier, right? So if I don't want the stuff that's in the EMS E3, which is this Azure AD premium plan one, and I'm gonna talk about all this stuff in a little bit more detail as we go, but this here is that core Cal bridge. And so really you'll see the Windows Server Cal rights that I talked about, the Microsoft Endpoint Configuration Manager, that is your um, SCCM, okay? There's some Intune stuff in there as well. Um, that's the uh, both the mobile device manager and the new application manager stuff where they're trying to replace System Center, but that's that's that. Then you've got Azure Active Directory RMS, Rights Management Server. And so Rights Management Server is a product that allows you to control um, document access and who can email and things like that. And you can do that both in the cloud or on-premise. And so and then they have some advanced threat protection that's retiring and things like that. But for the most part, if you don't want to purchase Azure AD Premium Plan 1, and I just want Windows and System Center CALS, or I just want Windows because I don't even use System Center, I, don't, I wouldn't go to the full M365. I may just do Office 365 Core Cal Bridge and Windows 10. Okay, So you can break that down this way. Now, inside of the bundles themselves, so if I talk about Office 365, some of these things in here are, I will call them services and others are products, okay? And the reason that I make the distinction between services and products are services are something that I just get, audit logging, for instance, with other products such as SharePoint, where the heck that one is. Or SharePoint, SharePoint down here, okay? And so some of these are products that I can purchase and some of them are features of those products or services within those, uh, within those products. I'll answer that other, other question uh, a little later, okay? So in an O365, you're going to see that this is made up of something What's that three, six, seven by five, 35 different products and or services, okay? And so there, you'll notice that in here, there are things like Exchange Online Plan 2, SharePoint Plan 2, OneDrive for Business Plan 2, okay? So what is the Plan 2 piece? There's another license that you can purchase that's just called an Office 365 E1. I don't have a, I don't have a slide on it. I'm just going to speak to it. And the biggest thing with an Office 365 E1 is that it does not include this right here, this Microsoft 365 Apps for Enterprise, which is how Microsoft renamed Office Pro, okay? So they used to have Office Pro click to run in Office 365. They renamed it Microsoft 365 Apps for Enterprise. And so that is your Office Pro license okay and so in e1 does not have that okay and then what they do is again i didn't get into all the product details but with exchange they have a plan one and a plan two and the difference there are a couple of things there are some features around archiving and journaling and dlp that are only in exchange plan two not in exchange plan one and there's differences in the size of the mailbox that you can actually have in plan one and plan two, okay? But the reason that I bring this up are there are an awful lot of users out there that do not use Office. And so some customers may have an E1 with an EMS or Core Cal Bridge and a Windows OS. Now, Microsoft has a concept called profiles in their EAs, okay? And so profile is a mix of these products, of these, enter these enterprise products. And so I could have a profile that's E1 EMS and Windows OS and a profile that's E3 EMS and Windows OS. Because I have users that need Office. So take that manufacturer, all my sort of uh, corporate users get an E3, my shop floor users get an E1 because they don't use Office. 
or if they do use office, they use it on a kiosk and we license that through an old perpetual device-based license or you know, some, other, some other mechanism, okay? And so the, the key thing to note is there are some differences between an E1 and an E3. And they are around what I'll call the core services, okay? So if you hear me talk about Microsoft core services, the core services are Exchange, SharePoint, Teams, and OneDrive, okay? Those are the core O365 services. All right, and the reason I say that is every plan has those and the core services differ in an E1 and an E3. So on exchange, it's mailbox size. It's some legal hold and retention things. Now, one of the things is everybody says, oh, we need legal hold. No company that I've ever come across, I shouldn't say that, there are some financial institutions that maybe need legal hold for just about everybody, but 90% of the organizations out there do not need these products for all their users. It's usually like director level and above that require them, okay? So they don't all need those plan two things. Mailbox size depends on your policies around what you wanna let them keep in there and how much. OneDrive, it's storage. So it's just the size of storage that you get for free with OneDrive. Teams, the difference between Teams is in the plan one, it's chat. So I can do the instant messaging and I can do one-to-one -one voice and video, but I can't do one-to-many and I can't do Teams meetings. I can't host Teams meetings. I can attend them, but I can't host them. Again, most organizations, let's go into a hospital, are doctors and nurses hosting Teams meetings. No, right? So they don't need a plan two of Teams, a Teams plan two. Um, and then with SharePoint, again, the difference between SharePoint plan one and plan two is going to be some of the legal hold type stuff again, okay? And so all these other products are out there. And what Microsoft wants you to believe is that everybody's using all these great products like Yammer, right? 3 million O365 accounts analyzed, less than 2% of users are using Yammer, right? Lists, where's Microsoft lists? Less than 1% of users are using lists. Um, what else can we, what else can we pick on? Um, Dell, I, I, the last time I looked, it didn't even hit my radar. And I'm gonna show you later today how, how we can see some of this stuff. The point being what Microsoft just did was made an announcement that they are going to be increasing prices on all their e-SKUs, except for the E5, by anywhere from seven to 15% because they crammed all these great new products in that nobody's using. So what does Microsoft want you to do as a customer with E3, Office 365, Office, let's say Office 365. They want you to sign an EA because it's the infinity, but now I'm paying for premium gas, Yammer, Sway, Delve, Lis, all this other stuff, versus go to the Maxima and maybe just buy Exchange Online or SharePoint Online, right? So one of the important things to be able to do as an end user is to figure out what your users are actually using to figure out, do these bundles make sense? There are definitely users, do not get me wrong. There are users where the way Microsoft prices this and E3 makes sense, but there are large portions of populations that they do not, okay? And so that's one of the key things is being able to go in and look at these products and figure out what they're doing, okay? So now, if we go over and look at, at, at this EMS suite, so I'm gonna go off of the O365 piece for a couple of seconds, I'm gonna go over to the EMS suite. Okay, so what is the EMS suite? Like I said, it's mostly your access to your on-premise Windows and System Center servers, and then Azure AD Plan 1. Okay, so Azure AD Plan 1 for Microsoft is password reset, multi-factor authentication, uh, conditional access, but it's not full-on conditional access, it's basic conditional access. Many organizations, are using Okta to do this. Over in here, I didn't pick on it, but you got things like Exchange Online Protection. Many organizations are using something like Proofpoint to do that, okay? I bring that up because understanding where you're using third-party technologies to do the pieces of this becomes important in your negotiations with them, right? 
If I'm using Okta and I'm in a three-year contract and I got 27 months left, no matter how much Microsoft gives me Azure AD premium plan one for, can I get any real business value out of it if they don't buy my Okta contract out? Because I'm not going to be able to go to Okta and go, hey, I want out, right? So understanding which pieces of these things you're using, and I'm going to talk about road mapping a little bit later, becomes crucial right? Because the way that they bundle all this. So think of any, when you see these charts and you see anything in dotted blue, like this Azure, I can buy that a la carte, right? And that, which means I can break this up. Like I said, most of these you can buy a la carte, but some of them are embedded services that you just get as a part of an O365 license, okay? Then I'm going to go over to green. This is our Windows 10 desktop OS. What is the difference between this and the OS that I get when I buy a brand new Dell, Lenovo, HP laptop? Okay. This is the enterprise edition of Windows. Okay. The big thing that many organizations are using is MDOP. Or not MDOP, sorry, BitLocker, sorry. Uh, BitLocker, boom, BitLocker is there. The reason that I said MDOP, and MDOP is embedded in here, and that is the, it, it's, you'll see it here. MDOP has the management pack that allows you to manage BitLocker with SCCM, and some organizations are doing that and others are not, okay? But the big thing here is BitLocker. But again, BitLocker is not something that organizations put on 100% of the desktops. There are some that do, most do not, okay? So, what, am, what else am I getting? And I, do, I, you know, for the life of me, I can't figure out what the long-term servicing channel means and how that impacts operations. But basically it's all around patching and whether it just automatically gets pushed or whether you can bring it in, test it, then to choose when to push it out and things like that. But a lot of the things that are in here, are, that's, those are the main things that are the difference, right? So we still have clients most clients, because of the way that the EA worked, and that this is, again, why I wanted to go through the history. Most clients, because of the way that the EA worked, went and purchased the OS as part of those EAs years ago, got on that train and have it in it. And probably about 90% of EAs have the Windows OS in them. And so it was a natural push into M365 for Microsoft. But we are seeing companies that are successful saying, I'm not paying for it because I get Windows 10 Pro with my uh, desktops when I buy them and we're fine with Pro. And so you need to understand when you're looking at these licenses, which parts of the Windows OS that is in the E3 or enterprise piece you require. And do you need them for all users to do an actual cost analysis of whether purchasing this thing makes sense or not? Most people are buying it because we historically always have. And most people are buying it because Microsoft will say, well, if you buy the M365, we'll give you a 20% discount. But if you go and buy Office 365 E3 and EMS and don't buy the OS, we're going to give you a 0% discount. And therefore, it's more expensive. So they like to play the discount game in order to get you to do that. That's something they can't do on the CSP program. They can only do that in the EA. Okay, But that is one of the key things to note here is that with the OS, it, this is the enterprise edition. There are some differences. One of the things I tell people, there's a, like if you Google Microsoft uh, Windows Pro versus enterprise, there's a chart that comes up that shows you all the differences. Go through it with your, your, uh, like your desktop team and have them tell you which one of the enterprise features they need. When we, when we do engagements with clients, we're like, go through this and tell us which ones you need. And then tell us whether all your users need it or not. Okay. So that is Office 365 E3, EMS E3, and Windows E3. And again, all three of those together are what they call Microsoft 365 E3. The, the thing to note is I do have choice and I have flexibility. My flexibility inside of an, e, uh, inside of an EA is to buy Office 365 E3 or E1, which we talked about, EMS or Core Cal Bridge, Windows 10, or do M365. My choice in the CSP is to do whatever I want based on my use, which could have advantages. But don't forget that the way Microsoft bundles these things. So if I took all the components of an E3 
and added them up and then looked at the unit price of what Microsoft caught. So if I bought all, cause I could buy all these service, all these products, not the services separately a la carte, so to speak, and added those up. I think it's about a hundred dollars in e a license, but Microsoft sells an E3 for like 27. So they're betting a 70 some odd percent discount in there. But most organizations are only using the core services and office out of this. Okay, so you have to look at you have to look at what makes sense. Okay. So the next thing you've probably heard of is Microsoft talk about an E5. So what is an E5? An E5 is the kitchen sink. <laughs> okay. Um, and so what what happens with an E5 is it just it's going to add more products to the Microsoft suite. So over here, you're going to see an Office 365 E5, an EMS E5, and a Windows 10 E5. When you buy an E5, you get everything that's here. Then you get this. Okay, so I'm going to start with the easiest one first. The easiest one is Windows OS E5. What's the difference between E3 and E5 on the Windows OS? Microsoft Defender for Endpoint. So if you trust Microsoft from a security perspective and are going to kick out Symantec or McAfee or Silence or whoever's doing your endpoint today, go buy E5. If you don't trust Microsoft for security, do not buy Windows E5 because it doesn't make any sense because you're not going to use Defender. Right? If I'm just making a decision on the OS, the only difference is the Defender product. Okay. In here, this is one product. This are all the features of it. You can't buy these a la carte. Okay, so I either get everything for Defender or nothing for Defender. I can't go and say, I just want web content filtering from Microsoft. You have to buy full Defender, okay? In the EMS suite, what I get is Cloud App Security. So Microsoft's CASB solution is called Cloud App Security. And I get Defender for Identity. And then I get Azure AD Premium Plan 2 Step Up. And what that actually starts to give me is privileged identity and risk-based conditional access, okay? And so you have to be a fairly sophisticated security organization to require either of those. And the other thing is most organizations are not going to need privileged identity and risk-based conditional access for 100% of their users. It's usually gonna to be top employees or employees that have access to sensitive data, right? Now, in some organizations, maybe even healthcare, where you get into some legislative type stuff like uh, PIPA and things like that, maybe everybody needs to have it, okay? But in, in many organizations, they all, not everybody needs to have it. So the main difference here is in an EMS, so I'm just talking EMS right now, in EMS is I get their cloud, App security or what's, what is Microsoft's CASB solution. I get their defender for identity and I get privileged and risk-based conditional access, okay? And so that's the over and above the Azure AD plan too. Again, there's other players in this place, this space. Microsoft is new here and these are newer products from them. And so what, what I will say is from an adoption perspective, we're seeing people interested, then they start to get into pricing and they're not so interested anymore. Okay, um, but that is the difference between EMS E3 and Windows um, and, and Windows E5. Office 365 E5, the E5 Office, the main difference there is I'm gonna add in a couple of extra things. I'm gonna add in audio conferencing for Teams. So they get a conferencing bridge, they get my analytics, uh, they get the Individual, so you're going to see like cloud app security in different spots. This is a lower level than this. This is sort of like individual cloud app security uh, versus enterprise wide. Um, and then they get a phone system, so they can use they can replace their desk phone, and they get Power BI. So unless your users are using, you're getting rid of I don't know your Cisco desk phones and giving your users Power BI, and Office 365 E5 usually doesn't make much sense, okay? So now, 
what have they done inside of the full E5? You're going to see these two other products that have creeped in, these two in black here. And then they have a couple of extra ones inside of this one, okay? And so these are their new security suite and compliance suite, okay? And so with the security suite, I get application guard and safe documents, and then I get defender plan two and defender plan one for Office 365. And so that's anti-phishing, it's safe attachments, it's attack simulation. So these are all security, real heavy, like they're, they're high end or they're, they're security products, sorry. And I get that. And then I get inside of this security suite, I would also get Defender Endpoint and Azure AD Plan 2 and Cloud Security and Defender for Identity. So what can I buy separate here, okay? So let's just say all, I don't need the E5 stuff up above here, but I want it, you know, Defender Plan 2, I want Azure AD Plan, Plan 2, and I want Defender for Endpoint. I could buy a bundle called the Microsoft 365 E5 Security Suite that has all of those. Or I could just buy Defender for Endpoint, Azure AD Plan 2. I can buy Defender for Identity and CAS App, CAS App Security separately. I can define Defender Plan 1 or Defender Plan 2 separately. Okay, so inside of this suite, I can a la carte everything basically. So when I'm looking at whether I wanna use this, I wanna go out and find out what the, the security team is planning. What are they looking at doing with Microsoft technology? I understand which pieces they are and then do a cost benefit analysis. What's the cost of the suite? Eight bucks a user. What's the cost of Defender Plan 2? Cause that's all I need, two bucks. Defender Plan 2 it is, right? Depending, depending on how that math works. Those are not the numbers I'm making those up by the way. Um, but I can pick and choose across that what I wanna do, okay? The next one that they have is a compliance suite. And the compliance suite is made up of basically three different solution types. E-discovery and audit, insider risk management, and then information protection and governance, okay? So what do I get with each of those are in these boxes. So e-discovery and audit, I get audit and e-discovery, right? Insider risk management, I get a customer lockbox, I get privilege access management, I get some information barriers. So that's all around insider risk, making sure that we know that our data is being kept inside, that only people that have access to it should, that should have access to it have access to it. And then the compliance suite is data loss prevention um, and records management and information governance types, type products, okay? What can I a la carte here? Nothing. It's either this, 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 or this. Okay, so remember that customer that I talked about that said that they only needed Teams data loss prevention earlier this morning? They are being forced to buy this entire suite for this one product. So if they go in, like if you think about it, and if you said all of those are equal, I don't know, there's about 10 different products in there. All of those are equal. They're using one tenth the value of the product and they're being forced into this whole suite. And the reason that they're being forced there, quite honestly, is Microsoft's the only company that has a data loss prevention product for Teams today, right? If you think about it, like some of the, the, the names that you hear here are like Proofpoint, Commvault, Silence, like these are the, the big competitors for Microsoft. So again, when we're doing um, an analysis of a customer's environment, we wanna understand what they're using in here, but you also wanna understand what competitive products you're using, if any, and if you are, what you're spending on those and when your contracts are up. Because I've had instances where teams have come and said, we're gonna to go to Defender Plan 2 and Azure AD and we're gonna do this and we're doing that. And then you start asking the questions about when are your contracts up? And they're like, well, they're not up for two years. This one's up in 18 months. This one's up in three years. And you're like, okay, you're spending $5 million on all those contracts that you can't get out of. And then you wanna spend $5 million with Microsoft. So you're gonna take that and go to 10 million. And then they go, oh, hold on, that doesn't make any sense. But they don't think about that. They would have just gone and negotiated $5 million to security products with Microsoft and then went, oh my, now we're screwed, right? Okay, 
So a couple other concepts that are important to note on this. That enterprise concept in the EA is 0365E3, EMS, and Windows 10. When I buy E5s, I set the baseline at E5s. The floor is set at E5s. So we have people that are like, oh, we think we're going to go to E5s, so I'm going to go and buy E5s. And then 18 months later, they're like, well, we can't use it. Our technology doesn't work or we can't roll it out, whatever it is. And then they're stuck with those E5s. CSP, we don't have that problem. They could just say, well, we're not using E5s. Let's flip them to E3s or E1s or exchange online only, right? Because I have that flexibility. And in the EA, I'm stuck, okay? So what happens as well is if I buy it as an, o3, an O365E and EMS, or the Windows, those are those enterprise products I'm stuck with. If I buy just eDiscovery, or I just buy Defender for Endpoint, that is an additional online service. What's the advantage there? The advantage is if I don't end up using it, I can zero it out on my anniversary date if I give them 30 days notice. So, hey, I think that we're gonna use information protection and governance across the organization. So let's go and negotiate a deal with Microsoft. We go out, we negotiate a great deal with Microsoft. And then at the 10 month mark, we realize we haven't deployed it. I can zero it out if I buy it that way. But if I buy it as part of the M365 E5 suite, I am stuck with it. So again, it's a cost risk benefit analysis that needs to be done to figure out what's the best way to purchase these things, depending on our, what our roadmap are, how far we're deployed, what the risk tolerance are we're willing to take on being stuck with these things. If I buy any of these individual services, because let's say I don't buy an E3. Let's say I just put an E, let's just say I put EMS and Windows 10 on my EA, because I can do that. I can still buy Exchange Online. If we're just using Exchange Online, we don't use SharePoint, we don't use Teams, you know, we're using, I don't know, uh, Slack and something else. Um, but we use Microsoft email, we want to move it to the cloud. I can buy Exchange Online and guess what it becomes? An additional product. All right, so I can still one off these things if I don't purchase the full e bundles. Okay. So again, those are important concepts. So the, the, the things to note are you have a ton of options. I mean, I think if you really looked at putting these together, like it's infinite, like it's probably like 100,000 permeations of how you could buy everything depending on use, right? But you have that flexibility and you have to go through and do an analysis when you're looking at this stuff to do cost. In order to do that, you need data. That's what we're going to talk about in our next section. But that, you know, you can sort of, move those things around, okay? So there's two other part numbers I wanna talk about real quickly. Um, there is the Office 365 F1 or the M365 F1 and then the F3. So we talked about these two SKUs earlier. The first thing is there's a restriction on who can use them. And that restriction is they have to be a shared device user, right? So they have to be a kiosk user they can't have a dedicated device. Microsoft defines dedicated device as anybody that uses a device 60% of the time or greater, okay? So what is an F1? An F1 is kind of a silly part number because it doesn't have email, okay? So, but there are organizations out there with employees that don't have email, but they wanna give them access to say SharePoint. Okay, and maybe they need to give them access to SharePoint because that's where they do open enrollment once a year, right? And so they need to be able to go in and get in to sign up for their benefits. Maybe they put their pay stubs up there. Maybe they're in a role where there's some workflow that is done through SharePoint, but they don't have email. And we do see this. Uh, in fact, there's a, a company that's on this call that this is gonna make a lot of sense for. Uh, in their renewal, in, in a subset of their users, okay? And it's just, they don't have email, but we gotta give them access to SharePoint 
and we can we can do that. Now they put in a bunch of other things like Yammer, because everybody that's you know not technical loves social media type products. I'm sorry, I I can't help myself sometimes. I like uh, I like picking on them because I don't I don't get the Yammer thing personally. But um, but you'll see that there's a SharePoint. It's it's, it's called the online kiosk. You. They have Skype for Business Plan One. It's retiring. That's just going to be Teams, and that's instant messaging and chat, instant messaging only, right? And so here's the restrictions: they can't be administrator, administrators, they can't schedule Skype meetings or Teams meetings, they can't access productivity servers, so Exchange can't access it, right? They get Office mobile apps, right? So they get the web browser version of Office, which is, if, I don't know if you've used it lately, it's not bad. Right, so you can send them a Word document and they can open it up and read it. It's read only, right? But that uh, that got rid of a big bunch of problems because a lot of times you might they might have to open up a Word document to look at something, like instructions or something, but not do anything, not edit it. So they can uh, they can do that. Okay. Um, the other thing to note here is <laughs> it's so <laughs> so I love when Microsoft makes licensing rules that they technically can't enforce. To get an Exchange Online Kiosk Calendar. So you can use the calendaring function of Exchange, which means they have an Exchange account, which, oh, by the way, they can't stop you from sending them an email, but they're not supposed to get it. So it's, it's a, it is a little bit of a compliance challenge to manage, right? We don't see a lot of people using this because most people, if they're you know, in the organization, they, they have an email. I can add EMS E3 to that. So I can get the identity, I can get access to my Windows servers and things like that. It does not include a Windows license, right? Now they should be using a kiosk and if those kiosks, you need to license them with Windows E3, you can still buy a device-based license for them. Um, so you can, still, you can still manage your OS in those environments, but these really are, uh, the use scenarios are, are few and far, far between. Um, we have we have some scenarios like I, I can give a couple of examples where because people ask me where would you use this um, in healthcare. There's a, an example where you have non-credentialed physicians, so those are doctors that aren't your employees but have rights at the hospital. So you don't give them email, but they need access into SharePoint to do various things. That's that's a great example. Um, we have uh, I, I can think of an example where. Uh, retired employees need access to SharePoint, but you don't give them email anymore. That's a, that's another another sort of example where where something like that would make sense. So the next one is the F3, and so the F3, unlike F1, includes email. Right, so I, I get an email. I cannot use Outlook, so it's web access only. It's got a pretty small mailbox. I, I always forget the size off the top of my head. We could Google it pretty quickly and find it, but you know, they get a they get an email box. It's limited in size. They get OneDrive. OneDrive is limited in size as well. Um, oh, is it a gigabyte that they get? It might only be a gigabyte. Anyways, it's it's pretty small, but most of the users that use these things are not heavy email users and things like that. Thanks, thanks Dan, it's two gigs. <laughs> um, so, you know, there there is a use for it. It's use, oh, it even says in OneDrive two gigs there and Exchange. Thank you. Helps if I read. But you do you do get a little bit more functionality. But again, this is is for kiosk users. You do get the F. You can do the EMS in here, and then you actually can get a Windows F3 license. And so now you can put Windows. It's user based, but your kiosk you can now put Windows on. Except for you can't use long term servicing uh, channel. And you can't use the MDOPS. You can't really manage it. Is this is probably the best way to to state, right? So sometimes when we have organizations where the F SKUs make sense, and they're like, "Well, does it make sense to go M three sixty or sorry, M three sixty five F three instead of just O three sixty five? It really comes down to the OS and what they're doing there. And so sometimes it's like, "Well, we just put Pro out on those desktops, and we're happy with it. Then don't do the M three sixty five. Just do the the O and maybe the EMS, depending on, even on what you're doing there. Um, th there might be scenarios where we're not even using Azure AD, but we just need Windows Server Cal rights, and there's some different ways that you can get at that. We might just we might suggest just doing an O365 E3, or sorry, F3, 
with a Windows Cal, and the Windows Cal would be purchased on MPSA or some somewhere else. Okay, so again, there's a lot of options that go into this, and the key is really trying to figure out, okay, how do I put that all together and figure out which of these products make the most sense for me to purchase for my employees? Is it a bundle? Is it individual components? Because again, you know, in here, in an EA, what we use the FSQs for is to exclude people from the qualified user definition, right? That every employee needs a license unless they're less than you're buying an FSQ. And then if they're buying an FSQ, you don't need to buy an ESQ, but you still need to buy an FSQ for them, right? Well, sometimes we might even try and push Microsoft to just say, well, we don't even want that. We just want exchange online because it's all they use, right? So again, you really want to look at that you can do another cost risk of benefit of what's being out there and what's being used. And that, that comes to uh, the data piece that we're going to talk about next, okay? So we talked about those two suites. Here's just some other products that are related services, right? And all of these are just additional products. And so if they're inside of an EA, you don't have to buy them for everybody. You can just buy them for who needs them or who's using them, right? So you're gonna see your Visio Onlines, your Project Onlines. We also have team rooms. You have phone system, common phone system. So I get to ask that on a lot, like what's the difference between a common phone and a Teams room? Um, a Teams room, think about it as a boardroom. A common phone would be just like a phone room, right? So if you've got phone rooms where you got a phone and you want to get rid of the desk phones, but you put a soft phone in there, um, you would buy common room phones for those. Um, you're also going to see the power products there. So Power BI. Um, you can buy Power BI Pro, which is sort of like an individual user, or Premium, which is sort of like a, you know, buying a server and some more capacity there you've got your power apps and things like that. So those are all just related services that can be layered on top of that, right? There's something like if we looked at all the related services or diff all the different sort of things that you can buy in this online sort of world of Microsoft, there's probably close to 2000 SKUs nowadays uh, when you look at them all. Cause you know, LinkedIn can now be added to these things, Dynamics, you know, the CRMs, even some of the ERP products from Dynamics, et cetera, uh, can be added in. So again, those are all the, the, the products, okay? So just to summarize this section, because I know this, this is, again, it's a lot to kind of absorb, but the key thing to note is, what does Microsoft want to sell you, okay? And I actually, let me go back to my, Oh, I closed it. That wasn't smart of me. Whiteboard. Just give me a second to open this up. Sorry. Okay. If we take kind of like a Gartner Magic Quadrant, and you'd put um, value here and strategicness here. Okay. What Microsoft has done, and I will not try and write with that, is over here, you're going to have any of the on-premise products. Okay, so this is gonna be um, Project, Visio, not the online versions, Office, SharePoint servers, Exchange servers, sort of things like that. Just slightly above those in the value from Microsoft, are gonna be Windows and SQL servers, okay? Over here, you're gonna see what I'll call the core online services. So you're gonna see Office 365, the e SKUs like E3 and E1. You'll see Windows OS here. You'll see the EMS E3 suite here. Okay, you will see things like Project and Visio online. You might see Teams, right? Actually, I think Teams probably goes more up here. And so then you're going to get into their strategic product. You're going to see the Teams, and not the Teams that's included in the e the E three bundle, not your chat and your thing. This is Teams rooms and the phones and the stuff that takes out the enterprise telephony type systems. 
like the Cisco rooms and the Zoom rooms and stuff like that. That's what they're going after here. You're going to see the power products, Power BI, Power Automate, Power Apps. You're going to see Microsoft 365. You're going to see anything that has an E5 after the end of it, and you're going to see Azure. Okay. So what is going on in Microsoft? And this is again a little bit of psychology of how how you deal with of dealing with Microsoft. The more you go to the right and the higher you go, the more value Microsoft places on that product. So anything that's in this quadrant here, they don't care about. You could go to them and say, I got to purchase $3 million of project online or project and Visio licenses. And they're going to say, well, buy project and Visio online. You're going to go, I don't want them for whatever reason, but I'm buying 3 million. Give me some discount. Right, because that's what that's what we would do if we're buying three million dollars of project Visio, and they're going to go, no. And nobody internally even gets paid on that. Nobody gets quota relief from selling those products anymore. They just they don't care about them. They're all going to disappear over to here. Even Windows and SQL servers and the size of those two enterprises inside of Microsoft, they don't care about the on-premise licenses that much anymore. We had a client that needed to buy $8 million of SQL licenses, couldn't get a penny of discount out of them unless they were committed to moving them into Azure, okay? And then you have the stuff that they've sold you for a long time. Even if you haven't deployed it, or you're just getting to the point where we fully got it deployed and I'm coming up for renewal and I've got Office 365 E3 and I got EMS, and I got the Windows OS, and I just want to renew that. I don't want to move to M365. I don't want to move to E5. You're not strategic if you don't move up into here. And this is where they put all their focus on. So if you want a deal from Microsoft, if you take your products that are inside of your current spend with them that are coming up to renewal and sort of map them in here, think of it. If I used to get some discount over here, None. Maybe got some, very little. Here, uh, okay. Oh man, this is where they get excited, right? And so when you see them in their negotiations, why they're always pitching this stuff, even if you tell them I'm not using it, I can't use E5. Nope, not all my users are gonna use Power BI. Why would I ever buy an Office 365 E5? It's because that's where they're getting incented, okay? The other thing to note with Microsoft is, they don't just get incented to sell. It's not, they don't, they don't have what I'll call traditional quotas. They have to go and sell. They have a quota and they get paid to meet their quota, but they don't get a percent of sales, right? It's not like traditional commissions, so to speak. It's a different sort of model. And so they, they, they retire quota here and here. They don't require quota to retire, retire quota over here, but they have massive incentives in their, their variable comp plans around deployment of product and around selling net new and selling the higher stacks. And so they're pushing you here based on compensation, not based on what you need. And so unless you document that I'm only playing in these three quadrants and I'm not moving up here and I got lots of reasons. We're in all those security contracts for the next three years, it's $5 million. You're not gonna buy them out, so I can't move. You know, we're not moving to Power BI. We don't need all that. We're not doing Power Apps. Uh, we chose AWS for whatever reason, or, or we're staying on-prem, we're not even moving to the cloud, you've got no leverage with them up here. And so you have to understand your usage stats if you wanna drive down costs, because what most people are seeing is if they're playing just in these three quadrants, you're gonna see 20 to 30% price increases in your renewals. And they're not gonna budge. They just announced that E3 is going up 7% as of March. So if your renewals in June, when most of them are, you're automatically at 7% higher list price, probably got some discount three years ago, not gonna see it this time. We're gonna see half of what you got last time, okay? So this is the way to think about them because that's the way they think. And mapping your products into these sort of categories and understanding where you have, and then doing a roadmap to see what you can maybe switch or shift and figuring out becomes key to negotiating with them. And the data that we're about to start talking about is what helps you do it all. Okay, so I know that there was one question. Um, don't know if I answered it. Okay, so. 
Oh, okay. So how can the calendar of contracts be manipulated or changed? Like shut down a 12 month EA for CSP intervening in four to six month termination. So you can't term when you sign an EA, you're stuck in it for three years. There's a termination clause, but even if you terminate it, you still got to pay for everything that you have in it. It's just, you just can't put anything new in it. Okay. And so the timing becomes in an EA, there's two, two times that you can make changes in what you're doing on your anniversary dates. I can adjust all those additional products down to zero potentially. And any of my enterprise products, I can adjust down to what the baseline is. I can also potentially make shuffles between them. So let's say I made bought E5s and I have E3s on there. I may be able to make some, sh some minor, sh minor shuffling between them, okay? So then the other time within EA is at renewal. And at renewal is when you really wanna be doing the real heavy investigation of, does it make sense for me to move, be moving out of an EA into say a CSP or some sort of hybrid of it, okay? Even if I'm in an EA, there are scenarios where CSP might make sense. An example may be, even if I'm at, so level A, I said the list price on level A is equal to um, the, the unit price on an EA. And if I go up, levels from an EA level A to B to C to D, there's about 7% between levels. So, you know, once you get up into B, C and D, it's hard for CSP to make sense from a per unit price. But if you look at the full package, it might still make sense to move some of those. But there are scenarios where maybe I put my project in Visio on there because I know users don't use them all the time, right? We have one client that has a thousand Visio licenses. And when we analyze the row 365, 100 users use it each month, 900 use it periodically. And so if they're on the CSP, they can shut those licenses off and turn them back on when they need them. As long as they got the ability to manage that process. But for 900 Visio licenses, the amount of money that they save, they could actually hire an FTE just to manage Visio and project licenses, right? So you can definitely make it make sense. And so with them, we're actually suggesting that they put all their project in Visio on a CSP maybe leaving the hundred that are the core on the EA because the unit price is about 15% better that they're getting, but put the, the rest on the CSP and then shut them off when they're not using them and then only turn them back on when they are because you know, you know how Project Visio goes. Somebody says you're a project, you open it up and maybe make some changes to it and then you send it back to them and you never touch it again, right? It's that sort of stuff that you want to get rid of. Power BI is another one. A lot of the times people start using it unless they're really a an analyst, they're not gonna use it full time. And so they start out pretty heavy. And then and we, we've seen the stats, signed it, used it for 90 days and then didn't touch it again for six months, right? So there are some scenarios where it might make sense to put certain products on there. Um, depending on what you're doing, maybe you put like exchange online only for certain users or archiving there for certain users. So there's, there's a hybrid mix that makes sense. And again, that's just an analysis that needs to be done. Um, with the CSP program, so you, like I said, there's two ways that you can buy. You can prepay for a year, or I can do month to month. Now, to date, Microsoft has not made any difference in change at price. So if I prepay for a year, it's $120, or I buy it monthly, it's 10 bucks, it's still 120. So I, I guess the only reason you might wanna pre-buy is cash flow management or ease of not placing, like paying every month, I guess, maybe. Um, but they haven't made they haven't made it so that it, uh, there's a price difference or advantage to prepay. So if you've done it for a year, you, your your uh, ability to change is on that year because you've kind of prepaid, right? If you've gone month to month, you can change, you know, the next month. Uh, it with some CSPs, what we what we've done with some is uh, we know you have a thousand users. We know 700 is going to be a solid number. Do a prepay on 700 so that you know, you, it's easier to manage from a, a purchasing perspective. Do give yourself flex on 300. Like, so give yourself flex on 20 to 30% of the licenses on month to month, right? And so, you know, depending on the client, the scenarios are different, but um, hopefully that, that, answers, that answers that. Okay. Are you able to lock in prices? before the price increase if the renewal is after the increase. All right, so I'm pretty sure that question is about the March 31st price increase. So 
Again, here's an advantage and a disadvantage. To the EA, if I lock in before, the price increase doesn't impact me for three years. CSP, if I did a prepay for a year, it doesn't impact me until that year's up. If I go month to month, it impacts me in March, right? So an EA does have an advantage of a price lock for the term. Now, that price lock could play the other way with like our, our anybody that purchased power apps uh, Microsoft decreased the price on power apps by 60%. So if you locked in for three years, you're paying higher for them. So um, if your EA is after June, there are a few tactics that can be done. Uh, one of the things is to try and negotiate the commercials with Microsoft in February and March, and then get the contract basically done. And then it's signed and then it just goes forward in March. That would be, that would be one way. There's a couple other tactics that uh, we could take offline on that. Are you able to split products quantities between an EA and CSP? Some projects, is, yeah. So I think I answered that one. If you're in an EA, those enterprise products, the enterprise qualified, the qualified user definition is going to restrict what you can do with those. Anything else, you can split across the EA and the CSP, right? So again, it sort of just depends on on what you're what you're doing there. Okay. Any other any other questions on sort of the bundles? Or again, clear as mud probably, but uh, you know, it's, it's a lot to take in. Um, and, and this is why, you know, I started with that story of, you know, I me mean, catching the blue whale or the blue whale. That would have been a really big one, Jordan, if I had caught a, a blue whale. Uh, catching a, a, a blue marlin, um, you know, was all about the teamwork that was needed. And this is, this is a prime example. Just understanding these licensing bundles is a full-time job. And I feel for those of you that are responsible for purchasing like Microsoft and IBM and Oracle and Adobe, because all I specialize in, my, the firm specializes in all of those, but all I spend my time on is Microsoft and it's a full-time job keeping up on it. And then understanding how to use the data to put it all together is a whole other level. And that's why it's not a single, when you get into these negotiations with Microsoft, they're no longer one or two people. It's not like here, throw it over to procurement and let them beat them up for the highest discount that they can get. Right, because I tell people, if we go back to, you know, over here, if you're all down in here and the highest discount you're going to get is like, I don't know, let's say five percent. If we came in and optimized and looked at things and changed your licensing mix and did a bunch of different things and pulled out twenty percent and you got zero percent discount, you're fifteen percent ahead of the game. Right, and I don't care what size of organization you are. Fifteen percent of your Microsoft spend is significant to your IT budget, because Microsoft is probably going to be your largest software publisher, if not in your top three. Smaller organizations, they're going to be the number one software publisher in your your budget, most likely. Bigger ones, maybe Oracle or SAP, uh, potentially could outtake them with some of the enterprise apps and uh, and things like that. But Microsoft is significant enough that saving 15%, it, 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 has, it definitely has an impact whether you're spending 200,000 a year or 200 million with them.